here today and everyone listening is touched by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, good morning once again. We'd also like to welcome those that are now joining us in our live stream. Our theme throughout the Advent season was on gathering light, how we come into the light and then how we gather more of the light of Christ into our life. And today we will be looking at our final message as we look at walking in the light. And so our scripture reading comes from 1 John chapter 2. And just as the Holy Spirit inspired these words to be written, let us invite the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, to inspire us, to give us insight and understanding, and more than anything else, the application of God's word into our daily lives. And so beginning in 1 John chapter 2 with verse 5, Spirit speaks through John saying, But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new commandment but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old commandment is the message you have heard. Yet, I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light, but hates his brother, is still in the darkness. And whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness, and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Let us pray as we seek God's guidance this morning. Lord, as I come before you, I acknowledge that I am utterly dependent upon you. I cannot do this in the flesh. Lord, I wouldn't want to do it in the flesh. I ask the anointing of your Holy Spirit. I ask that you will give the message as you would have it to be shared today. Lord, I pray for each and every one listening. You know where we are in our journey. You know what we are needing to hear from you. Lord, while I cannot possibly speak to every heart's need here today, we know that your Holy Spirit can do that. And so, Lord, we invite you to speak to us. I ask for your cleansing, Lord, that you'd make me a vessel that is fit for your use. And I ask that what we do here today will glorify you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. It probably would not come as a surprise to you if I were to say that we live in a world of counterfeits. And with the rapid growth of e-commerce, it has served as a platform for unscrupulous individuals looking to make a fast buck by preying upon the unsuspecting. Some time back, I bought an expensive fragrance on Amazon for what looked like a really good price. I was so excited when I found a 6.8 ounce bottle for the same price as a one ounce bottle at Ulta. Uh, this is great. And then when I received the package, it looked like the real thing. The box looked identical, the bottle was the same, the cap was the same, everything looked just right. It even smelled the same. That is, until you'd had it on just a short period of time. And then the scent was gone. 
I thought I'd learned my lesson. No more fragrances on Amazon. Now, men, let me tell you, if you're wanting to impress the lady in your life, don't buy perfume off of Amazon. The only thing that that is going to do is eventually she's going to figure out just how cheap you are. Read my lips. Don't do it. Now, I wish I could say that I had learned my lesson. But it was around the same time that I found a pair of shoes on Amazon. These are the same shoes that I have been buying at Macy's. Now, these were dress shoes, and I have to say they are the most comfortable dress shoes I have ever worn. And I found them on Amazon 60% cheaper than what I had paid for them at Macy's. And I thought, this is great. And after wearing those shoes about three months, the soles began to disintegrate. See, we live in a world of counterfeits. And it's not just in e-commerce. You can go online, and I mean, my wife Vicki and I, we've done quite a bit of traveling over the years, seen some beautiful places. And every now and then, I'll see these pictures of places that we have been, and they just look beautiful. They're amazing and bold and vibrant. And I'm thinking, I've never seen it look like that. And that's the problem, they're too good. See, these days you don't have to be a good photographer. Your composition can be thoughtless, your camera crooked, your image can be under or overexposed, and with just a few clicks of a mouse, you can have an unbelievable image. You can even put yourself somewhere you've never been. And that's the problem. It's unbelievable and these days anyone I mean anyone can be legally ordained into the ministry in just a matter of a few moments I had heard about this so I went online you could go online now if you're willing to do this you can go to the Universal Life Church online and I mean, when you get there, it has get ordained, and you just click the button, and you can get ordained as fast as you can answer a couple of questions. And it's totally free. I had to try it out just to see. And so I registered. I have been ordained under another name. I went on there uh, on Friday evening when I was working on my sermon just to check this out. And I have been ordained as U.R.Kidding. Yeah, I mean, it didn't take very long. You see, you can be ordained with people like Lady Gaga, Conan O'Brien, Stephen Colbert, and Paul McCartney. And I mean, we're talking about some of the greatest counterfeit theologians of our time. You can fake anything today. We live in a world of counterfeits. And unfortunately, you even find counterfeits within the church. Which brings us to the question, how can others know that I am an authentic disciple of Jesus? See, our theme throughout Advent has been on gathering light. And so let's just take a few moments and review some of the things that we have been looking at through our time together in this. And we began with God's assessment of our human condition. This is God's assessment of the world in which we live when he says that we are living in darkness. We are living in the land of the shadow of death. And that means in spite of all of our impressive accomplishments, there is one area where we have made no progress whatsoever. And that is the condition of the human heart. We continue to struggle with things like fear and hate, crime and conflict, 
War and racism, injustice and intolerance, prejudice and abuse, and the list just goes on and on. And even with all of our advances, thinking that we live in an age of enlightenment, it seems like the condition is growing worse. But there is good news. God doesn't just give his assessment to tell us how bad off we are. It's to prepare us for his answer. And God's answer to our darkness was to send a great light. And that light is Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. And yet just seeing that Jesus is a great light is not the same thing as living in the light. See, when you see that Jesus is the light of the world, what it does is it brings us to a crossroads. It brings us to a place of decision. Do I want to continue living in darkness or do I want to move into the light? And if I want to live in the light, then it means that it begins with me accepting Jesus for exactly who he says he is. I have to believe that Jesus is Emmanuel, that when Jesus was born, it was God with us, that he is God in the flesh. This is God incarnate. And that Jesus came to this earth so that he could give his life as a ransom to pay our sin debt. And that Jesus died on the cross paying our sin debt and that he was buried and that he rose again. But even believing that is not enough. That's the first step. Believing changes nothing. And the Bible says that we have to believe in Jesus as our Savior, but we also have to confess him as Lord. And that means I'm confessing what's in my heart. It's not a lip service to Jesus. It's where I truly believe that Jesus is the Lord and that I am surrendering my life to him. I'm yielding myself, making him the Lord of my life, the master of my life, the one who is going to govern over my life. And when I do that, it is a commitment that I am making to the Lordship of Jesus. And the moment that I do that, I become a child of God, a child of the light. I have moved from darkness into the light. But that's the beginning of my journey. Now that I've come into the light, I am to be gathering more and more of the light of Christ into my life. It begins with the relationship where I move from the darkness into the light. But now that I am living in the light, I am to develop that relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm to be growing deeper in the relationship because he has invited us into a personal intimate relationship with him where we know him more and more. It's where we begin doing that through fellowship. And fellowship is where we begin walking in the light. It's experiencing Christ in our life. It's drawing upon the resources and the life of the family of God. And that's what brings us to our question for today. How can others know that I am an authentic disciple of Jesus. In other words, what is the evidence that I am walking in the light? And John tells us in this passage that our relationship with Christ is made visible when God's love is truly made complete in us. Jesus stated it this way, Hopefully you can finish this. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, that's the goal of discipleship. That's the result of spending time in fellowship with Christ is that I am growing in his love. There is no greater evidence of authenticity of being a disciple of Christ 
than when God's love is truly made complete in us. Now, why is that? Well, it's because love is so easily seen. And the reason that love is so easily seen is because love is one of the greatest needs that we have as a human being. In fact, after the physical needs that sustain life have been met, the greatest need in every person's life is to be loved. And so it makes it obvious when someone is loving. In fact, we don't just want to be loved. We need to be loved. And yet it seems like there is a shortage of love, especially in an ever-increasing society that becomes more selfish and more self-centered all the time. I think that's what makes the old song, What the World Needs Now is Love, so timeless. That song was first recorded in 1965 by Jackie DeShannon. And since that time, it has been recorded by over 100 artists. And it's been in numerous movies. And it's because the chorus of that song nails the needs of our life. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. See, the reason that the authenticity of our relationship with Christ is made visible through love is that people are starving for love. And that's the glorious news of God is that his love is made available to us. First and foremost, it's through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and coming into that personal, intimate relationship with him. But then as we grow deeper in our relationship with Christ, his love flows in us and through us touching others around us. And it's truly amazing because as we fulfill the command to love, it is simultaneously meeting the greatest need in other people's lives and at the same time it is satisfying the needs of our own heart. See, love is one of those things that you can't give it all away. The more you give, the more you have to give. And when we are loving others, it fulfills that desire in our hearts. See, we were not only created to be loved, we were created to love. And so love is the goal of discipleship. And it's not a suggestion. What John is giving us today isn't saying, I'm really suggesting that we start loving others. No, it's a command. If you're a disciple of Jesus, he goes on and he says in chapter 2, verse 7, Dear friends, I am writing you a new command. I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Now, that sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? I'm not writing you a new commandment, but I am writing you a new commandment. But it's an old commandment that you've heard since the beginning. But yet, at the same time, it's new. I mean, what's John talking about? What is it that he is saying to us in this? Well, he says it's old. In fact, the command is the one that Jesus identified as the first and greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul and with all of your mind. The first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the command to love has been around since God first gave the law. It is an old commandment, and yet John says it's also a new commandment. Jesus said the same thing in John chapter 13 when he says, A new command I give you, 
love one another. What's new about that? Well, it's that Jesus goes on and further qualifies it. Love one another as I have loved you. You see, in the old command, it was love one another as you love yourself. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. See, there's a big difference, isn't it? I gotta be honest, sometimes I get so ticked off with myself, I don't even think I love myself. A lot of people actually struggle with loving themselves. And so Jesus qualifies it and says, let's take this up a notch. Don't just love one another as you love yourself, but you love them as I have loved you. Have you ever thought about how difficult it must have been for Jesus to love some of his disciples? I mean, when you really stop and look at these guys, I mean, consider this, look at Peter. I mean, Peter could be boastful and arrogant, and I mean, Peter could open his mouth before he engaged his brain. Then you have James and John. I mean, James and John were selfish. They were ambitious. Jesus gave them a nickname calling them the Sons of Thunder. And by the way, that wasn't a compliment. They could be hot-headed. And then some of the disciples were stubborn, others were doubting, and one even betrayed him. And yet Jesus loved every one of them. But then, as I bring it closer to home, I have to ask, what about me? And as I've already confessed, I'm not always easy to love. Now, I do have a news flash for you, though. Now, you may need to hold on to something. I, I don't know. But I got to say it. You're not all that easy to love either. Just saying. See, people aren't always easy to love. That's the thing about us, is that sometimes we can be very unlovable. And yet we are to love others just like Jesus loved us. That is an unconditional love that loves you just like you are. Now when it comes to Jesus, he don't, he's not satisfied to leave you that way. But when we look at the love that Jesus has for us, he showed us the full extent of his love when he died on the cross to pay our sin debt. And you see, that kind of love doesn't just happen in our life. We have to learn to love like Jesus. See, it's a process. It's not like I come to know Jesus and now suddenly I'm able to love everybody just like Jesus loved me. Hopefully you can start loving them that way. But John describes it as a process. He says the darkness is passing. When I come into the light of Jesus Christ, I am in the light, but there's still darkness that is passing in my life. And as I gather more and more of the light of Christ into my life by deepening my relationship with him the more of his love I'm gathering into my life. And the more of his love I gather into my life, the more it flows forth and touches others. And so really the question that we need to be asking is simply this, is the darkness passing in my life? Now that doesn't mean that there's not going to be times of weakness or anger. But am I growing? Is the darkness passing? And since it is a process, it can be measured. And so John goes on and tells us how to measure the progress in our life in verse 9 and following. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light. 
You see, that is the test of authenticity. It's a simple question. How far have I come? And the answer is found in my attitude towards others. And if you noticed, he presents two options here, love and hate. Now, we sometimes get this idea that it's on a continuum. In other words, you got love on this end of it and hate on this end, and sometimes you can fall somewhere in between. But that's because we really don't always understand love and hate. There really is not a continuum at all. See, we tend to think of love as being an emotion, a feeling that we have. And it's true that love does produce emotions. Some of them are really good. But that's the product of love. I want you to say this, love is not a feeling. Say it with me, love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. We choose to love. It's not if we feel like it because people sometimes you don't feel like loving them. But we're to love them anyway. And that's how Jesus loves us. He loves us any way. And when it is a choice, it means I am choosing to put others before self. And here's the thing about love. There is no such thing as a passive love. Love is active. If love is not active, it is not love. Now, we also make the mistake of thinking that Hate is just simply an act of hate, but hate can actually be expressed in two ways. That may be why we think there's some kind of continuum. Now, we know all about active hate. I mean, that's when we are malicious in our thoughts or in our actions or in our words to someone else. But hate can also be passive. And passive hate is expressed through indifference and coldness and unconcern. And perhaps it's the passive form of hate that is the most cruel way to hate. See, passive hate is to do nothing when I have the power to do something. Let me ask, which one do you think hurt Jesus the most? Those who actively hated him and wanted him dead or those who were passive, those who were indifferent and idly stood by. See, the hard truth is this, whether it's active or passive hate, if I am hating, I am still in the darkness. Now, what that means is the one who hates is not in Christ. John says he's still in the darkness. He's never come out of it. See, there's a difference between being in darkness and walking in darkness. To be in darkness means that I'm not a disciple of Jesus, that I've never been a disciple, that I'm not redeemed by Christ. And John says the effect of that is, as I don't know where I'm going. Now, obviously, that's true about what's going on in my life because I'm in the darkness. I don't have a clue where I'm going. But it also goes into eternity. You see, those who are counterfeit believers in Christ, they don't know where they're going. They've never come into the light of Christ. They think that they're going to spend eternity in the kingdom of God, not realizing that's not where you're going. That's what hate does in our life. It keeps us in the darkness. Now, I know it's true, a disciple can succumb to not loving at times. But when we do, it's only temporary. We're never, or I'm sorry, we're never just satisfied with that. We know we're not perfect. We know we don't always get it right. But when we fail, we're never content with it. I want to share part of my story with you. There's some of my story that I'm obviously not proud of. 
You probably have some parts in your story like that too. But I grew up in a community and in an area where there was a great deal of racism and I was a product of that. And I'll never forget when I got serious about my relationship with Christ. I've shared that part of the story with you before and I won't go into the details on it, but I was just getting more and more into the word of God. I started reading it once a day and then I started reading it twice a day and finally the Holy Spirit said, if you're going to feed yourself three times a day, why don't you feed yourself spiritually three times a day? And so I did. I was reading the Bible every day in my life three times a day. I get up, I'd eat breakfast, I'd read the scriptures and I'd go to work and I got an hour for lunch. That tells you how old this story is. And at lunchtime, I only lived a half a mile from where I worked and I'd go home, I'd have a quick bite to eat and then I would begin reading the Bible again. And I can see this day just like it happened. I know exactly what it was like. It was near the end of summer. I had come home. I had eaten something for lunch. I sat down on the end of the couch and I began reading in 1 John. And when I came to the passage that we read this morning, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And the Holy Spirit addressed that racism in my life. And he says, if you hate, you're still in darkness. And I don't know about you, but I didn't want to be in darkness. I repented right then. And I gave my racism to Christ. He forgave it. And I came into the light in that part of my life. The darkness was passing. Because I came into the light. And I have to tell you since then, I can't stand racism. I don't want it in my life. And anybody that's a racist, I don't want them in my life. I'll be real honest about this. If you're a racist, I don't need you in my life. Amen. The only people I've ever unfriended on Facebook were racist. And it's like, I don't even want to see your garbage. I've had the same garbage in my life and I don't want it. You see, you can't be content with hate if you're going to be walking in the light. And so there's a question that he has for this is simply, can others tell that I am an authentic disciple of Jesus? There's an old song that we've sang many times. They will know that we are Christians by our love. That's what John's telling us here. That is the mark of an authentic disciple of Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit will just take it and use it in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, we ask that you will just reveal to us where we are right now. Am I loving? Is there darkness that needs to be passing? Am I still in the darkness, Lord? May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts today. And it's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I would invite us all to stand if you are able as we sing our closing song. And if God's Spirit is working in your heart, the altar is open this morning. And if you need to talk to me, I'll be there and I'll pray with you, talk with you, whatever you are needing in that. Or if you just want to pray, you can do that.